hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where we are again live from Rome today to talk about ancient mythology. And you may be thinking ancient mythology is a long time ago, but it is alive and well and current in our everyday lives. And we've got Darius Aria, an archaeologist and uh, just sort of ancient explorer extraordinaire to talk to us all about the origins of these ancient myths and how they live and persist all around us even today. Now, a couple things before I turn it over to Darius. One, we want to keep this interactive. This is alive and, and living and breathing mythology. So let's keep it interactive throughout. Darius is going to ask you a bunch of questions to find out what you know. And we'll even play a game of fact versus fiction because not all mythology is really myth. So use the chat box to the right of the screen to answer his questions. And throughout the class, if you've got any questions for Darius about your favorite myths, legends, or just ancient traditions, ask those questions there. And in the last 10 minutes or so, I'll interview Darius with your questions to get you some answers. Also make sure you've got a camera nearby. You can't go on a virtual field trip to Rome, a beautiful setting like that and not have pictures to prove it. So have a camera nearby in about a half an hour. We're gonna give everybody an opportunity to lean into the screen, get your virtual vacation picture from Rome with Darius. And if you upload that to Instagram and tag Darius Aria and Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win a prize package that includes a week of ancient adventure camp with Varsity Tutors this summer. There's a link on your screen if you wanna learn more, plus a box set of all the Percy Jackson books. You know Percy Jackson, Jackson, obviously you're a fan of, of mythology. If you don't, you're going to learn a little bit more about him today. So have that camera nearby. All right. With all that said, we're live from Rome. So let me turn it live from Rome to the man, the myth, the legend, Darius Ari himself. Hey, thanks a lot. Hey, it's great to be here. There is a little bit of noise behind me because the Roman Forum is closing, but we can see a beautiful view of the Roman Forum from here. So I am literally standing on antiquity the epicenter of ancient Rome. That building right there, that brick building is where the Senate met. We can see the Palatine Hill where the Palatine Palace was of the emperors, but also where Romulus founded the city. So today we're gonna to be talking about myths. We're gonna be talking about origin stories. We're gonna be talking about the beginning of ancient Rome. So the first question we can ask is what and why are myths? So where are these things coming from? Well, let's, let's, start with, let's start with planets because we have the myths that are surrounding us in our daily lives. And when we look up in the sky and we look at the planets, can you name a planet that's named after a mythological figure? Let's see some names here, like Mars. Mars is one of my favorites, the red planets named after the god of warfare. Venus, Venus, goddess of love, okay, and which one is not named after a Roman god? Uranus, Saturn, these are Roman myths. These are Roman gods. So who's not named after a Roman myth? The only one is Earth, which is an old English name. Otherwise, everything else is going right back to the pantheon of the Roman gods. Now we talk about how the planets got their names. The ancients, the Greeks and the Romans looked up in the sky and saw these very particular stars that were more than the stars. And of course they were the planets and they named them after the important gods that they thought lived in the heavens. Mars, the God of war, Venus next to Mars, goddess of love, Mercury, we have the messenger God, Jupiter, of course, Jupiter is the biggest planet. So you're gonna have the biggest planet named after the king of the gods, Jupiter. There's Saturn, an agricultural god. His temple is right here in the Roman form still today. We have Uranus, which is the sky god, and he would then be the consort, the husband of Earth, Gaia, in the Greek world and the Roman world. We have Neptune, and of course, that's the god of the sea, and then Pluto, the god of the underworld, which I guess today is still not considered, and nowadays not considered a planet. So we can think about how humans then created myths to explain what was unexplainable. So think about the myths that are out there that when people didn't know so much about science and they try to come up with solutions to strange happenings like an earthquake, like a volcanic eruption or even lightning. So there must be a God up there and he's mad at us and he's throwing a lightning bolt. There's a volcanic eruption. It's the Cyclops, they're working on the anvils, they're making the lightning bolts for the sky god. There's an earthquake. 
it's because the god Neptune or Poseidon is angry. So people came up with explanations for what they couldn't explain. They also use myths to have origin stories. Where do we come from? Why are we as a people in our city, in our country, why are we special? Why are we all the same? Well, because we're all descended from this mythological figure or this mythological idea. And finally, think about the way in which myths can explain a common bond, history and culture. Even today, think about when you're reading about American history, you get stories, you get the George Washington chopping down a cherry tree, cannot tell a lie. Think about the ideals and goals that each nation wants to instill in you, like a manifest destiny. Or, oh, we have a lot of land, we have two oceans, we can do great things, we can expand and multiply. These are some of the myths that we have in our own Roman, in American history, and of course, in Roman history and Greek history, it was very, very similar. Now, when we look at all these legends, we see in this particular chart that there are some basic common features. So if I'm making up the stories around the world. Think about the commonalities of human beings. Love, war, peace, nation building, okay? And you're looking for ideals to identify with. So you personify them, you make them into a person. So there must be a leader of the gods. That's Jupiter or Zeus in the Greek world. There's love, the goddess of love that inspires us to love each other. There's Aphrodite and she's Venus in the Roman world. But wisdom is Athena and Minerva. And we look over here at the idea of light and brightness and enlightenment. We can look at Apollo and in the Roman world, he's still Apollo. So sometimes we have direct borrowing from one people to another from the Greek world to the Roman world. Sometimes they coincide, sometimes they overlap, and sometimes they even just plain out borrow. And that's okay. Now let's turn to the great Roman myths. Who founded Rome? Tell me right now, guys. Who founded Rome? Let's hear some ideas. Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar, in a sense, founded Rome when he created this role of the emperor ruling Rome. See, somebody says the popes. Well, that's true too, in a way, because after the ancient Roman Empire, there's the Holy Roman Empire, and of course, the popes, inspired by antiquity, are making their own new Christian kingdom. Okay, who else do we have? Constantine. Constantine kind of founds the Christian empire. Well, let's turn back to the beginning. Let's turn back to the original founder, and that's going to be Romulus and Remus. And did they even exist? Everyone needs an origin story. So we can definitely begin at the beginning and we can begin with Romulus and Remus. So with Romulus and Remus, they have humble beginnings. And the myth is told in brief. They were destined for greatness. They were destined to threaten their grandfather. So they are uh, born and then put in a, a little crib and floated down the Tiber River, abandoned in the, in, the, in, the, in the hands of fate. And as fate would have it, then washed ashore, they were suckled by twins and they were uh, eventually going to be the uh, founders uh, together, uh, growing up as shepherds, uh, they would try to found a city and they argue with each other and it's Romulus that is the founder of Rome. And that's what we have to say as a little introduction to, um, to Romulus. And we're gonna get back into whether or not they actually existed because that's the, that's the million dollar question. That is the million dollar question is whether or not they did indeed exist. So again, they float down the river, they wash ashore. They're supposedly, the story goes, suckled by a she-wolf to make them strong, to nourish them and let them live in the, in the wilderness essentially. And they go on to found the city of Rome. So goes the story. The story goes that Romulus and Remus were born not so far from here in another town called Abalanga, but they were a threat to their family. So they were put in a basket and floated down 
this Tiber River. And the story goes that they washed ashore right about here, right by the Tiber Island, which exists in the center of the Tiber River. They washed ashore, they were discovered by a local shepherd, and Romulus goes on to found his city on the Palatine Hill, a city that was destined for greatness, Rome. Did they exist, Romulus and Remus? Did this happen when they washed ashore here? Fact or fiction? So that is the big question here. Do they indeed exist? So we have to have the founder. We have to have the story in which there is indeed somebody who's going to be starting this civilization, have the villages that eventually become a greater and greater city as Romans go on and conquer and overshadow their neighbors and absorb the other villages and other neighbors. But the real question is, was there a guy named Romulus? Was this just made up? So the thing is, there has to be a name. The traditions are perpetuated. The traditions are passed down orally. People from father to son, mother to daughter told this story. There has to be a founder. So there literally could have been a person named Romulus. But the thing is, that part we're not able to verify. What we can verify is when the Romans say Rome was founded, there was indeed the beginning of a settlement on the Palatine Hill right behind me. So was he descended from the gods? Was he descended from the god Mars? And, and was he suckled by a she-wolf? That stuff probably was not the case. But these are ways in which we can imbue and give more power and resonance to that particular story. Now let's talk about a little bit about descendants. Where do the Romans come from? Where does anyone come from? So people tell a story in an oral tradition, in an oral tradition, and they pass this down. And you tend to want to have something that's quite um, noble and tied to a larger narrative, a larger story. So the Romans said they descended from the Trojans through the Prince Aeneas, who escaped the destruction of Troy, made his way to Greece, made his way to Italy, and finally it's his descendants that start a beginning. It's a way to underline that you were somebody more important, right? You don't make your descendants just coming from out of the blue, or your parents were farmers, why not make yourself descended from nobility or even gods? It's a typical uh, thing that people do in ancient civilizations, descending from someone greater than the average. Now, a famous myth, going back to the time of Romulus, is the abduction of the Sabine women. And so the idea here, the story goes, is that Romulus, well, he had a bunch of friends, he starts a city, but there's not much of a population. So he needs to grow his city. How does he do this? They steal away people from villages nearby. And I'm talking about literally, you know, not even half a mile away. But what happens is the story that's told by the Romans that they're uh, bringing other villages to themselves is, the, is an underlined in all of their stories and myths. And then going into laws and going into their histories that are written down that Rome absorbs and merges with the outlying uh, cities and villages. That is how Rome grew. Other city-states, they just grow as their city grows. But the Romans were all about, come on, join our city. Be a part of our village. Be a part of this ideal. We don't care what your background is. So it's kind of like, you know, in America, when people go to Ellis Island, here come all the immigrants from Europe coming over to America to start a new future. It's that kind of myth that we're told here. Another story that we can tell is the punishment of Tarpeia. Now, this one comes with a warning. The idea here is Tarpeia betrays the state when the Sabines are attacking the Romans of Romulus. So going back to a mythological times, she says, I'll let you slip in to our, our fortified hill, the Capitoline Hill, if you give me what's on your arms. She was referring to the gold bracelets on their arms. They were also their shield arms. So when she lets them sneak in to attack the Romans, they then take off their shields, not their gold bracelets, and bury her alive, as you can see in the image. They bury her alive with their shields. Because even though she helped them assault the Romans, she betrayed their state, and you don't do that. So this is also one of these myths. Imagine Aesop's fables, all the fables that we learn all the time about the ant and the grasshopper or whatnot. And the idea is that um, these stories, these fables can indeed 
allow you to connect to the way, for example, being a good citizen, please make sure the state comes first. It's not about, it's not about the, it's about yourself. It's about what can you do to sacrifice for the state? The state comes first in the city of Rome and their mythology. And we have a, an image here of the Pantheon. And the Pantheon is a temple to all the gods. It's a magnificent temple and it's in Rome and it is magnificent. And the idea here for the Romans is that they had their own kind of manifest destiny, the way that you're learning in Roman history and in American history as well, is that we're destined for something great. Lots of nations have said that. And one of the ways the Romans do it is they actually do evocatio. They call out the gods from all the cities that they're going to war with. Oh, goddess Juno from Vey, please come into our city. We'll give you a better temple, this kind of idea. So the Romans over time, as they go and wage their wars and make contracts with other peoples and make alliances, they're bringing in and inviting all those other gods. And that's the way in which Rome and their stories and their myths can grow and grow and grow and be successful because they have more gods on their side. So now we can talk about a fun thing that I wanna get you guys involved in. It's fact or fiction. So let's review a number of myths, Roman myths, and discuss whether or not they're actually true. So it's fact or fiction. The story so the goes that Hercules was on one of his 12 labors and he passed through this spot right here, the ancient cattle market of Rome with a bunch of cattle. And when he took a nap, a monster stole some of the cattle away. He killed the monster and the people that lived here before Rome rejoiced and built him temples and a big altar, the Ara Maxima. He was worshiped as a God. So the question is, did Hercules come here? Did Hercules even exist? Fact or fiction? To the Romans, he was real and he was here. Here's the million dollar question then. Hercules is a god famous for the Greeks. He travels around the world. He travels around the Mediterranean. And that's also underlining the reality that Greeks were traders and Greeks were traveling all throughout the Mediterranean and forming colonies and living all throughout the Mediterranean. So Hercules also represents the Greeks traveling through here. Was there a super strong man, son of Zeus? that actually took a cat nap on the banks of the Tiber River and had his cattle stolen? Probably not, but what's behind it is the Greeks for trading, even in the area of Rome, all throughout Italy. They colonized Italy very early on, and then we have the founding of Rome. So right about that same time. So it's a way in which we're underlying real you know, realities of the culture of the Greeks. Did Hercules really exist? Not likely. So the next question is, was Here Julius Caesar a temple of, of uh, Venus we Genetrix? That's Venus, the ancestress. And this is a temple in the form of Julius Caesar. So Julius Caesar built a forum space for celebration, for uh, all kinds of activities, and he puts a temple to his ancestress. So that is, Venus is the originator of his family line because she's the mother of Aeneas. Aeneas escapes the destruction of Troy, goes on his own odyssey to Italy, founds a city, and the descendants of that city are Romulus and Remus. Romulus founds a city, and his descendants are, according to Julius Caesar's family, Julius Caesar himself. Fact or fiction? Okay, so it's a fact that Julius Caesar existed. It's a fact that Julius Caesar is one of the, the great statesmen and generals and the first official emperor in the city of Rome. Was he descended? from Venus through this whole line. Venus had Aeneas, Aeneas escapes the destruction of Troy, makes his odyssey to Italy and his descendants are Romulus and Remus, Romulus then being an ancestor of Julius Caesar. Again, noble families, they wanted to have that kind of importance. And if it were just, oh, my family came from that little village over there, that's not very exciting. So the noble people, the educated people, they tie themselves to those traditions. And of course, by the time Julius Caesar is telling that story, his family has been politically important for hundreds and hundreds of years. Hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, like the age of the United States, one family. So they've got power and of course they had more of the right in their mind that they could be descended from the gods. It worked out well for him. 
Now, the next question is, was Aeneas a real person? Aeneas descended from Aphrodite all the way in Troy. Aeneas escaped the destruction of Troy, and he goes on an odyssey all the way from Turkey to Greece to Italy, and his descendants are Romulus and Remus, Romulus founding the city of Rome, and eventually leading to the creation of the Roman Forum. Now, did Aeneas, who was a mythological figure, did he actually exist? Did he really, was he somebody descended from the goddess Aphrodite, Venus? And are his descendants Romulus and Remus? Fact or fiction? The question then is, the question is, well, could this person be descended from a god? I don't think that it carries much weight nowadays. Okay, you read Percy Jackson, you're reading about all these demigods descending from uh, uh, the, the great deities like, like Aphrodite and Venus. It sounds exciting. It'd be wonderful if you could see them going to school and so forth, but you know, probably not. Uh, but there were obviously from the destruction in wars like the Trojan War, people, there was an exodus. People did leave. People were refugees. People were living for new homes. And that part of it kind of rings true. And of course, we have the spread of those refugees throughout the Mediterranean, according to these oral traditions. So that kind of part of it could have really happened after the destruction of such a grand, uh, a grand kingdom as Troy. And now we can ask, did the Trojan War even happen? And that's an even bigger question for us because it ties in all these mythological figures and all of these gods. Did it happen? The Romans said that they were descended from the Trojans. The Trojans, Prince Aeneas, who escaped from the destruction of Troy. But did the Trojan War happen? Behind me is a second century AD statue of an emperor, Marcus Aurelius, on a horse. But the famous horse, the horse of Troy, did it exist? Was there a Trojan War? Did the Greeks sneak inside the belly of a wooden horse, get carted inside the walls of Troy, and then kill everyone from the inside? Is this just a myth, or did it happen? Fact or fiction that eventually led to the founding of Rome? Well, the Romans, in all of their literature and poetry, they said, we are the new Troy. We are the new Troy. They believed that. They're tapping into a mythological cycle, the biggest one of all from the Greek world, the Trojan War. And so the question is, did it actually happen? So we know archeologically that Troy did exist. We know that we're a series of wars and eventually it is destroyed. So we have that kind of legacy. And of course we have oral tradition. So I think there's a lot that goes into that question. Did the Trojan war happen? Yes. Was there a Trojan horse? Maybe, maybe, but definitely afterwards there would have been refugees, there would have been people that would have traversed through the uh, Mediterranean trying to find new homes, those that did not yet get enslaved. So it really is a big question that we can ask. Then ultimately, uh, those descendants were Romulus and Remus? Now, I don't know if we can answer archaeologically, but we can say it was a story that was floating around there and the Romans embraced it and took ownership of it. Now the question is, I want to ask you is, where are they now? So here we have examples of some images of people that are running. And Epipides was a famous soldier that when he is going to announce the victory at Marathon, he runs 26 miles, arrives in Athens, and he says, Nike, he says victory in Greek, and then he dies. So here is the story, the myth that is attached to the reason why we have the Marathon. Now, I can't even imagine running a marathon because it's so far of a distance. I'd probably be like him and I'd pass out and die. But now, of course, we have marathons going all the time. And I think the world record is probably under two hours. So the idea is, though, where does it all come from? It came from this incredible moment, this incredible event. And one soldier runs in all of his armor 26 miles to announce this important victory to the Athenians. So it's kind of mythological because you think that if you run 26 miles, you're not going to die from exhaustion. Apparently he did. He had pushed the envelope in the sports. And now we can celebrate those sports in the Olympics and world competitions. But it's based all the way back in a realistic kind of myth in the ancient Greek world. So the thing to keep in mind is whenever we look on the Internet or reading books or seeing movies, that mythology is all around us. Look at that Amazon packaging. 
Look at uh, Ajax Cleaner, uh, Trojans uh, for uh, or the Spartans for athletic teams, uh, Nike shoes, Goodyear tires with the with the winged shoe of Mercury. The bottom line is that mythology continues to be tapped into, to be borrowed from, to be uh, improvised, improvised from. So just keep a sharp eye out because the, the mythological figures are there all the time. And mythology is indeed all around us because when we look at uh, the Roman calendar today, we'll take a look at the names of those calendars, July and August. Those are the fifth and sixth months and they're named after Julius. Caesar, Julius gives us July and Augustus gives us the month of August. So that's one part of it. But the whole calendar system that was created by the Romans was about celebrating those myths and traditions and the festivals that went along with it to worship those gods. So we do wanna keep in mind that there are many guiding principles in our lives today that are stemming from these ancient gods, these ancient myths, mythology, timekeeping, calendar systems, ancient gods, astronomy. There's so much of which mythology is a big part of our lives. Now let's turn a little bit in the end to modern mythology. We have our movies, we have our Marvel Comics figures. We have DC Comics. I'm thinking about the Flash who runs really fast. You look at his symbolism, he's Mercury for goodness sake. So people are getting empowered with some sort of special power. You guys all know Spider-Man. Spider-Man was bitten by a spider. But the myth that the Greeks tell is there was a woman named Arachne who challenged Athena or Minerva to a weaving contest and she lost. And as punishment, she ends up being shrunk down into a spider that weaves a beautiful web. That's the answer, that's the, the explanation, the myth to explain why spiders weave a beautiful web. So think about the different ways in which people get superpowers, but in ancient times, we're looking at the demigods like in Percy Jackson, one parent is a god, one parent is mortal, and we're getting into that kind of mythological tradition that combines kind of power of the gods and the power of the mortals. And that's what maybe today, looking at like a Percy Jackson novels is a way that kind of makes those myths seem fresh again. Now here we see them going to school and we tap into a lot of the gods, we tap into a lot of the myths that get enrolled into those kinds of novels. I think it's, it's really a lot of fun and it just underlines that once again, anybody can take these myths and take these images and stories and make something new and fresh that's gonna be appealing to everyone today. Awesome. Thanks so much, Darius. It's just, uh, it's so cool to see. And it's even see, you know, the wind blowing in uh, in Rome. I always love these live from Rome classes. So thank you for uh, sharing so many uh, Roman myth mythological stories, getting, giving us a chance to be archaeologists, trying to play fact or fiction, or what would we want to investigate a little bit more. Um, really incredible. To all of you out there, you guys have been asking some amazing questions. So please keep those coming because uh, we're going to keep, uh, you know, keep, make sure we've got time to, to get them all answered, I guess. We'll, uh, we'll keep answering them is what I meant to say, if you keep them coming. Um, in the meantime, though, first, we want to make sure everybody gets an opportunity to take a, a picture with that amazing scenery out there. So have your camera near, cameras nearby. As you're logging into the phone, kind of getting yourself up, let me remind you um, that if you upload that picture to Instagram, tag Darius Aria and Varsity Tutors, and we'll have the official handles up on a, a slide on the way out. You'll be entered to win a Percy Jackson box set. You just heard Darius mention um, sort of, you know, methodical mythology come back alive in, uh, in a great uh, set of books out there for, uh, you know, for kind of young readers, it'd be per perfect. And a, a week of ancient adventures camp with varsity tutors. If you want to learn more about that, there's a link to click on your screen and even enroll right now if you'd like to. So with all that, I think you guys are, are logged into those phones and lined up. Darius, let me uh, take it back to you and uh, make sure, can you tell us what are we getting a picture with here so we know what, uh, where our vacation has led us? So wait, in the distance, you can see the Arch of Titus. We have the temple of Antonius Pius and Faustina, so emperors that became gods. And then of course we have the Cordia right here, which is the Senate house. So I'll just put myself in the picture.
Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and everyone, if you didn't get the perfect shot, uh, we're going to have Darius full screen when he's answering questions as well. And it's, yeah. uh, it's a pretty amazing scenery out there. So, uh, so make sure you get a, a couple of, of shots there. You can probably Photoshop out the, um, you know, the background, make sure it looks like you were really in Rome today, which, uh, which in a way we really were. So um, thanks for all of your questions. A um, lot of questions right now, Darius, people wanted to know, just, can you give us a little orientation to where are you in Rome right now? We know we're yeah. by the yeah. forum and sort of what's the significance yeah against of the forum just a lot of yeah. like hey we're at this amazing spot we want to know more about it I'll, so i'll pivot right over here so that's the senate house where the senate would meet typically uh in the forum piazza so this big brick building it's preserved because it becomes a church but it, it's uh, this is 1700 years old and we can pivot over here and you can see some temples in the distance and those are temples to some of the major gods Castor and pollux or greek gods they get absorbed by the romans um and on the hilltop there, that's where the Senate, the senators would normally meet, but by the imperial period, the Roman emperor is going to live. And if we pivot right here, just right here, there's a huge arch. So you celebrate your victories. So who's coming on a, on a level with the gods, really, is the emperor They can win these massive wars. This one is by the emperor Septimius Severus, and he is an emperor from North Africa, from Libya, which is part of the Roman empire. And uh, with the big war uh, success against uh, Iran and Iraq, we call it the Parthian Empire. This is one of the many things that he builds. It's a celebratory arch. And on top, we would have had gilded bronze statues or silver statues of the emperor and his two sons. So a lot of history right here. And then that's the Capitoline Hill in the distance. And you can even see some churches around here. So we're standing on modern street level. And uh, you know, you can kind of peer in and look down into the forum because indeed the uh, ground level has risen over the centuries. So that's where we are. We're in the heart, the epicenter of ancient Rome and the entire Roman empire. Uh, that's really amazing. Thank you for that tour. Just such uh, an incredible, incredible spot. And actually, while we're, we're talking about that, we, um, you know, we know uh, the story goes that Romulus and Remus, um, you know, invented, I was going to say, uh, founded Rome. Um, what's the, what's the date on that? How far, how long ago are we talking about where, you know, the forum yeah. was in its heyday or really Rome as we know it got started? So when you were talking about the time of Romulus, 753 BC being the foundation date, there are going to be some primordial kind of simpler walls around one hill and that's it. And the forum was a swampy land that they start to drain out about half a century later. So 50 years after the foundation, they start to occupy the lowland area, kind of fill it in and have to deal with some, you know, perennial flooding and such. Good. Washington DC was once a swamp. It kind of feels nice Absolutely. to know that the yep. capital of, uh, of my world is, uh, is similar to uh, the capital of the Very world, similar, so, very similar. Yeah. I mean, because bottom line is the bottom line is in the beginning, everyone's living on a hill because, you know, you're afraid of being attacked. So you live on a hill. Once you start to feel comfortable and you've controlled more land, you come down off the hill and you do your trading and buying and selling and, and uh, socializing and building the temples and gathering together. So that's only, then you have to drain it out because we're near the river. And so the river would flood. So you have to deal with the flooding. Amazing. Hey, speaking of similarities, uh, one great question uh, a couple of people um, you know, hit on here was, uh, we know that uh, Apollo was, you know, basically, you know, the same name of a god in, uh, in both um, Greek and, and Roman yeah. cultures. Yeah. Were, did, did they have the same characteristics or were there any major differences between them? Or was it, was it the exact same god or just really, really similar, I guess, is the question. So yeah, that, that's a great question. I mean, for all of them, you know, Venus to Aphrodite and uh, Zeus to Jupiter, there are going to be subtle differences. And in fact, if you go through the entire Greek world, it's all about city-states. So the Jupiter of the Spartans is different than the Jupiter of uh, the Athenians and so forth. So when we get to, I mean, uh, Zeus of the Athenians and Zeus of the Spartans over in the Greek world, but Jupiter, Jupiter could be different for people all throughout the Italian peninsula. But then they kind of found that kind of similarity, sky god, sky god goddess of love, goddess of love, and so on. But Apollo was one of those ones where you had a plague, you had people getting sick. So you appeal to your deities, they don't help you. Romans would go on search for other deities. Oh, this guy Apollo, he can help ward off this plague. They bring him in as a one-to-one. -one. He doesn't even get his name changed. So the Greeks were traveling, Hercules was bringing all these kinds of Greek ideas and they bring in the gods. 
And so then sometimes the names don't even change. Just like I said, the temple of Castor and Pollux, that's a Greek god uh, that are being worshiped. They didn't even change the names because they just brought them in wholesale, right? It's the whole idea. They didn't have to merge them or change them or anything. I think that's like early age recycling really is what it was, right? It's just sort of, uh, yeah. anyway, you know, let's, let's reuse it. We've got to, uh, you know, we've got, we'll just have our own version of it. Um, hey, another really great question I love here. And, and thanks to, I think a few people asked a, a version of it. Um, and so let's make it kind of a combo question. One, um, how do we, how could we tell, you know, what's, um, what was real? Um, you know, we have all these origin stories and it seems like, you know, there are partial truths and all those, so I guess part one is, you know, what, what's, what old traditional stories were probably more real than fake, if there are any that we may know of. And then two, how do archaeologists go about investigating that and trying to find out what was fact and what was fiction? Those, those are great questions. So, um, you know, a lot of the things uh, when they have these ideas of these stories, and then they say it happened here, and you're looking then maybe at the archaeological evidence for a particular site. Like this is a place that there's a sign that says, this is where lightning struck. So if lightning strikes an air, it becomes sacred to the God. You find the inscription is talking about this. So there's no reason to doubt then that, uh, you know, lightning struck a particular uh, area of land. And then it's what they do with it afterwards. And they build a shrine, people make offerings. And the archaeologically you dig, you find the remains of those offerings. And so, you know, certain things that happen in reality, like the earthquake, and it topples down the walls of the city. And then you rebuild, but you also can make offerings to that deity to ward off future earthquakes because they don't know anything about the fault lines. So sometimes you can tie in those historical facts, the archaeological evidence backs up, and then you ultimately find the remains of inscriptions of people praying to a particular deity to help ward off future earthquakes and whatnot. So the, I think archaeology can tie up you know, the, in the material culture with a lot of these stories in specific physical places. Everything else, you know, the, the oral traditions that then become, uh, you know, poems become in some sort of dedicatory inscription, that, that can take you so far. But when you tie it into the, the real people, the offerings, the physical dedications, the archeological sites, then we're really going somewhere with these, uh, with these myths. Like I was over there just around, just by the Tiber River with the Temple of Hercules. There are so many temples of Hercules. People really thought he was there. They really tied, they really believed into that. And ultimately he became the patron god of all the cattlemen who were working over there. So you get a tie in of a real epiphany, a real God appearance with the jobs of those people that were daily dealing with cattle. So you see how the reality kind of ties in with a very convenient kind of story. That's uh, that's that's really cool, and I love how. Thank you so much for being there on the ground with us to give us that look at that physical, where you know we know this is where they commemorated it. This is where at least some events took place. I think to be able to kind of you know soak that in is uh, is really incredible. Um, hey, and, and, and don't forget, and, and, oh yeah, sorry. No, I was just going to say, keep in mind everywhere that I've shown you today: the Tiber River, the Temple of Hercules, here in the Forum, and so on. The Temple of uh, Julius Caesar and his ancestors, goddess Venus. Everything's within half a mile of each other. I mean, Rome is that small. The ancient Rome is not that big. That's really, which actually leads me to another question someone asked. You, you've taken us on some pretty cool Roman tours, you know, with, with the live classes at the Colosseum and, uh, you know, at the, the final place of, uh, of Julius Caesar, the Forum Albies. Um, someone wanted to know, what are some lesser known places in Rome that if anyone ever has the chance to go, they should really check out? As someone who's kind of seen it all, what, uh, what are your recommendations there? I was just having this conversation with a friend of mine today. Definitely go when you're in a church, see if you can go underneath that church because nine times out of 10, underneath some Renaissance church, there's an ancient ruin. It can be a temple, it can be a house, it can be something from ancient Roman times. So it's fun to go and explore on your own underneath San Cecilia, San Giovanni Laterano, San Clemente. There are tons of churches to go and explore. You got the catacombs, of course. And uh, so that's one thing I really encourage you to do. Uh, and the other part of it is there are such great museum collections here in Rome. But what you can do is you go and see them and read, oh, this is from here, it's from there. Then you can go visit those sites. So it's a fun kind of puzzle to play, a game to play, that you can go into the museums and you actually know where the thing came from and then you can go to that site. 
And I think that's a really exciting way to get involved with the material as well. Uh, and it's, it's, it's very rare that you can do something like that, the level in which you can do that, like ancient Rome. Well, and like you said, just incredible that everything is, is so close together that uh, you can see so much and, and explore so much in, uh, in such a short period of time and, uh, and all those kind of things. Um, hey, one question from Elijah I wanted to make sure to get in. Yeah. Thanks. I love when people yeah. put their names on them. I should have mentioned that um, at the beginning is, um, yeah. did were there ever fights between uh, Roman and Greek gods or even, you know, among gods of themselves? Want to know a little bit about in the Clash of the Titans style, uh, you know, did, yeah. uh, did the gods yeah. ever fight? fight amongst each other well yeah i think i mean and this is actually appearing in uh, uh like one of my kids is into manga and anime and things like that so you always have these grand stories of the titans and you have the the first generation of gods and the second generation of gods those are the younger gods that are the gods then that that people would would, would venerate the the zeus the aphrodite the series but they're the you know the children of the of the older gods like saturn or Kronos, as he was known so um, you do have those epic battles taking place then. And then there's always that fear that a lot of those monsters and those titans can come back. So that's always out there. And that's what, you know, like you say, Percy Jackson kind of ties into that and, and, and goes in his own direction with it. But, but by and large, uh, the Romans, as their empire expanded, they're playing up to those deities. But as they go and conquer people uh, in, in Egypt and, you know, what we call Tunisia and Morocco, or they're going all the way to Scotland, they're encountering other gods. Some things, some gods they can come to terms with, other ones they don't, but they're all trying to incorporate them into their larger and larger pantheon of their gods. So just imagine how crowded the gods that they worship became because gods are coming from all over the place. They're coming from Syria, they're coming from Turkey, they're coming from Greece, they're coming from Scotland, they're coming from France. And that's, uh, that's what, that's something, and they didn't fight, but they all were coming together and they're trying, the Romans are trying to make sense of all of them. Sometimes making an equivalence and sometimes not when it wasn't possible. That is really amazing. I, I, I love that whole story. We got a lot of comments about that too, of just, you know, kind of going and, and finding a place for the gods of the conquered people and, you know, borrowing the best of them and all, all that kind of thing is just a really fascinating way to, uh, to look back at, uh, at that kind of history there. Um, hey, one more, everybody wanted to know, um, do you have a favorite, uh, you know, Roman god or goddess and a favorite story from Roman mythology you can share with all of us, kind of your, your personal favorites? Okay, well, I'll tell you what, Here, here's what I say. I say, there's this story of uh, Apollo and Apollo was challenged by um, a satyr. So half man, half goat, his name was Marcius. And the, the moral of the story in the end is don't challenge the gods, but Marcius challenged Apollo to a musical contest. Apollo played the lyre like a harp and Marcius played these pipes that were actually invented by the goddess Minerva Athena, but she didn't like how it kind of disfigured her cheeks when she puffed on it. So she threw them away. Marcius picked them off. He got good at it. And they had this competition. Well, Marcius loses the competition. The punishment was to be skinned alive. And uh, it's a kind of a horrible story in the end to be skinned alive, but it, it appears in Greek mythology. It appears in Roman art and Greek art. And one of my excavations, I found a Marcius. So I was like, I know who this guy is. And we excavated this figure. He's about what you call three quarters life size. So it's probably about the size of my younger daughter. But uh, it's an it's a, it's a awesome piece because it's so kind of graphic. And he's, he's marble. He's made out of a marble tree stump as well. He's just sort of tied up in that moment of anguish. But it's amazing then to see. But those are the kinds of things, these myths that we've been talking about. They were decorating, they were on the wallpaper, the frescoes, the tabletop wear, uh, little figurines, votive offerings. The gods and the myths were everywhere. These are the stories they told to their kids and their artwork appeared everywhere. Also just amazing that you had an opportunity to discover something like that is, uh, is really, really amazing. So um, thank you for, uh, for sharing that with us. And yeah, I guess it's sort of to tie back to what we've talked about. There are so many similarities, you know, we have so many, whether it's superheroes or, uh, you know, origin stories, George Washington to us is everywhere, or, you know, our superheroes we see, you know, we wear them on backpacks and lunch boxes and, and sweatshirts and all those kind of things. So, you know, our stories kind of persist in, in the same way that those did. And, you know, 
who knows what archaeologists in in 10 years, no, not 10 years, uh, a thousand years, I got to multiply a little bit, will be discovering of us and excited to uh, to be able to talk about in, in their live online classes. So, um, yeah. hey, Darius, huge thanks yeah. to you. I guess let me, let me turn it That's to you. Here. I think we're, we're kind of around the, uh, you know, time yeah. here is uh, any parting thoughts? What's, uh, what's one thing, if, you know, if people are interested in archaeology, mythology, what do you hope they take away from today as kind of our, our last question for you here? Yeah, I would definitely say that the, these myths, these stories, I can say that they're eternal, okay? And this artwork that goes along with it, again, is something that is timeless. So there are ways to get into these stories, whether it's seeing a movie now or reading the books, but get involved in it. And one day you'll be going directly to that original source. There's that original story. And when you read about Apollo, when you read about Hercules and so forth, you'll say, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. I've heard of this before. I've seen this before. Make the connections with the other things that you've done in your life and your superheroes and the movies that you've seen. And then start to really dig a little bit. And you'll see just how enriching these stories and how influential these stories remain today. And not just for the, for the kids, it's for the adults, it's for everybody in artwork, uh, in, in, uh, you know, in, in, in movies and books and every kind of medium. These myths are eternal and I think you'll find them inspiring and engaging. Well, thank you so much. That's a great insight as always. And uh, it is so cool that we get to connect our own stories and traditions back thousands of years to, you know, all of our ancestors in human history. And um, thank you for helping us, you know, draw those connections and, and parallels and just for taking us on a tour of Rome. Uh, it's a, you know, really amazing opportunity to, uh, to just be live from Rome like this. So um, with that, promised that we'd uh, we'd get the official contest rules out here here are the handles to tag if you guys got the perfect uh, roman vacation selfie and want to post that to instagram you'll be entered to win that percy jackson box set to get more in touch with kind of modern interpretations of those uh those ancient roman myths and uh, and then also a week of ancient adventures camp if you don't want to wait to find out uh, see if you've won or if you end up not winning um the link on your screen will take you to where you can register and have an amazing week kind of exploring all things um uh ancient including some mythology there. So uh, with that, huge thanks to Darius for all of your insight, to all of you for all of your questions and participation. And we'll see everybody back here soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks very much. Take care.